malaria, when you think of the symptoms of malaria, there are the symptoms that are less severe and then there are symptoms that are more severe. So the less severe symptoms would be something like joint pain, headaches, fever, shivering, vomiting. And interestingly, some of these symptoms can also be seen for dengue or some other types of diseases, right? So how do you know for sure that someone has malaria and not dengue? So there are some tests that people do to really make sure that someone actually has malaria, right? And then in very severe cases, you can actually have um, hemolytic anemia. So anemia is usually a decrease in the levels of hemoglobin in the blood. When you say hemolytic, so heme is Again, hemoglobin, it's a component of hemoglobin, lytic meaning lysis. So hemoglobin, hemolytic anemia, meaning there is a breakdown or a lysis of this hemoglobin. So that is hemolytic anemia. You might also see uh, hemoglobin coming in the urine. There can be retinal damage. And then uh, there are some patients that also suffer from convulsions. And so it can, and in some very serious cases, the uh, the uh, the disease also seems to affect the brain. So there is a very specific form called cerebral malaria. So cerebrum for the brain. So cerebral malaria, and that is one of the most severe forms. And actually a lot of the children who die from malaria, they die due to uh, cerebral malaria, especially in countries in Africa. Then another thing when we think of malaria is also these bed nets. And what people have seen you know, over the years that the best way to actually prevent getting malaria is basically to prevent being bitten by a mosquito. So bed nets have been very important in uh, preventing the spread of malaria. And uh, like we also spoke about how when you think of malaria, you think of stagnant water. So there's just a cartoon for that here. Okay. So any questions here? Shall we move on? So Raghav says cerebral malaria is malaria in the cerebrum. Yes, Raghav. Do you want to type your question? Huh. So Nirali has asked a question, convulsions. So what is a convulsion? So basically, um, in India, another common word for it is fits meaning uh, people basically, the body starts shaking uncontrollably. That means the, the, the person has lost control on the nervous system. So there's a lot of trigger, trigger in the nervous system and the muscles start uh, basically contracting very fast. And due to that, the entire body starts shaking. So when you think of convulsion, it's basically a, very, a lot of shaking that happens. Then... Uh, so uh, Suhani is asking a question, how can we find that a person is suffering from malaria? So I'll come to that in a little while when I tell, talk to you a bit more about what causes malaria, right? So that is how we can know that it really is malaria that is causing the fever and not dengue that is causing the fever. Uh, so then um, Raghav has a question. So is there any cerebellar malaria, meaning the cerebellum? Yes, Raghav. So the brain has many parts. So cerebrum is one part. Cerebellum is another part. But when people talk about any, in the case of cerebral malaria, it could affect any part of the brain. So even though the word is specific to the cerebrum, when you say cerebral malaria, it could be even the cerebellum, it could be another part of the brain. So it could be any part of the brain, but it's a common terminology that people use for cerebral malaria. Okay, there are lots of questions. Uh, brain malaria. Yeah. So Snehal clarified that. So thank you, Snehal. So cerebral malaria is any part of the brain. Okay, let's uh, move on. And yes, Tanishka, because cerebrum is the biggest part of the brain. I think that's where the term cerebral malaria came from. Okay. Let's move on. So now let's think about what causes malaria. Some of you already actually spoke about this malaria parasite. But before we get to the parasite, maybe let's revisit, you know, like, how did they come to the conclusion that it is a parasite that causes malaria? So any theories? Anyone can think of theories now? Okay, now we know it's the parasite. But if you didn't know it was a parasite, what might have caused malaria? You think of stagnant water, right? Like, you know, we are making all these associations. So what could have caused malaria? So Tanishka, yes, quinine is the medicine for malaria. We will get to that as well. I have a slide about that. Lab accident, yeah. But, you know, malaria existed before labs existed, right? So in that case, what, how did people get malaria 
flood, so unclean environment. Yes, that was very commonly thought to be a cause. So Raghav talks about the bite of the plasmodium parasite. So it's the bite of the mosquito, which then, you know, brings the parasite in. We'll get to that a little later. So unclean environment. So that I think is really the typical, you know, before people actually had a microscope to be able to look at these parasites and these bacteria under the microscope, most of, most of the people actually thought it was unclean air. So let me get to, let me talk a bit about the history and then we'll get to how the parasite was discovered. Okay. So the first, uh, actually, if you think of, um, you know, the, it's, it's this, you know, hum humans have had malaria for a very, very long time. And uh, of course, we only have records from a certain period of time, right? So uh, when we think about when people started keeping records, so in 2700 BCE, this is around 5,000 years ago, right? So five millennia ago, or 5,000 years ago, in uh, there is this uh, Chinese uh, medicine text. It's a book where, which contains a lot of knowledge about Chinese medicine, and it's called Neqing. So here they describe malaria-like symptoms in China, right? So around 5,000 years ago itself, people were describing symptoms that were very similar to malaria, but however, in this book, they don't know what the cause is as yet. So... Um, then in 1500 BC, actually India also comes into play here, where uh, the Vedas, which are these ancient scriptures of, uh, uh, Indian, from the Indian subcontinent, they talk about these fevers due to insect bites, so, which is quite interesting, right? So already in around 3,500 years ago, they did not know, they didn't even call a mosquito a mosquito at that point, right? We call a mosquito a mosquito now. But at that time itself, they thought that the symptoms that are very similar to malaria, which are mainly these fevers, they could be caused due to insect bites. Then in... Uh, 650 BCE, it's very interesting, you know, in this was somewhere in uh, Babylon. So Babylon is this area where you can think of it as Greece and Middle East Asia. So in this region, there are some, there were some writings on clay tablets that were found. And here they actually attribute malaria to a god of destruction. The god's name is Nerhal. So they say that this god of destruction is the one who is causing malaria. So they call it that malaria is due to a divine cause. And then uh, Hippocrates, he is thought to be the father of modern medicine. So Hippocrates, he actually observed in 400 BC, so around 2,500 years ago, he talks about how uh, malaria seems to occur in a seasonal manner. So there are all these inferences different people are making, but remember, these are happening in very different parts of the world, right? So you have China, then you have India, and then you have Middle East Asia, and then you have Hippocrates, who's in Greece, right? And at that time, now we can basically travel anywhere within 24 hours. But at that time, to move between these places was really difficult. Difficult. That means the exchange of knowledge was also very difficult. So imagine if all of them had just sat together like we are doing today, right? They might have already found out in 2700 BC itself that malaria might have been caused by a parasite. Maybe, maybe not, right? So basically, um, just think about how, you know, there were distances. And that's why every discovery took a much longer time, uh, even 100 years ago, as compared to now, because we are all so well connected, right? So this, these are all like the ancient... Uh, theories that people have found in various texts. What about, uh, but the most accepted one, and this really became accepted, um, I would say, by, by 1500 uh, AD, was that uh, malaria is caused due to breathing bad or spoiled air. So that's why the name malaria, mal area, mal meaning spoiled or bad, and area meaning uh, air, and this is like an ancient uh, Italian word. So the word malaria comes into existence. I think the first uh, report of, you know, first written documentation of malaria was some somewhere in 1574 or something. So in basically the 16th century is when people start calling it malaria. And uh, they think it is the reason they get someone gets malaria is because they're breathing bad or spoiled air. And one of the reasons for this was because, you know, there were people were, you know, at that time, there were all these kingdoms, they were fighting with each other. So this one king would send his army to go and, you know, conquer another kingdom. So this army would come to an area which had malaria, and suddenly all of the soldiers would die. 
So basically, malaria is thought to have defeated, you know, caused certain wars to end because the soldiers who were coming from another area were not, uh, their immunity had not built, so they were not protected against malaria. So they would get killed by malaria. And at that time, they just thought it was because they were breathing this uh, unclean air. So, um, but of course, now we know that is not the case. And how did that discovery actually come to be? So for that, we need to think about three great scientists. One of them is uh, Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek. So why is Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek so important? So in the year 1676, he basically built this very rudimentary microscope. So you can see this image here on the right. It was the first you know, basic microscope that he built and he discovered bacteria using these microscopes. So uh, Anthony von, von, von Leeuwenhoek was very important uh, in, to some extent. And then uh, two other researchers, one is Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur. These people are also very important because they proposed something called a germ theory. So until then, a lot of people thought that the diseases were caused because you, you, know, you inhaled bad air, you drank unclean water, and they thought this is the reason why people were getting some of these diseases. But in uh, 1878 to 1879, Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur, they really proposed something called this germ theory. And what they say is that the reason uh, people are getting certain types of diseases, be it rabies or cholera or other types of diseases, could be because there is some germ. They don't know what the germ is as yet, but they say that there is some germ which can be causing this uh, disease. So, and that's when really a malaria researchers also were like, okay, 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 let's start finding a germ that might be causing malaria, right? And the first hypothesis, of course, was that it might be a bacterium because already bacteria had been described by Anthony von Leeuwenhoek. So they were like, okay, maybe bacteria. And for a long, actually, I would say for some 10, 20 years, Many researchers were really stuck on this idea that it is a bacterium that causes malaria and not something else. So then enter two, so if, if nothing else, the two people I really want you to remember from this talk would be Charles Louis Alphonse Laveran and Ronald Ross. And these people were actually working independently. So imagine one of them is in Algeria, which was at that time a colony of France. And then Ronald Ross, he's actually a Scottish person, but he was raised most of his life in India. Like his life really, he all he knew was India. And he was also a doctor, a physician, and he was working in India at that time. So India really does, in that sense, play quite an important role in the discovery of what causes malaria. So what happens is in 1880, Laveran, he discovers the malaria parasite in human blood. And this is uh, Charles Laveran here. And to the right here in this, uh, his, his, it's his original text, you know, book that in which he was making records. And he says, in French here that he's uh, drawing different aspects of what he saw in fresh blood. So he had a malaria patient. So Al in Algeria, malaria was very prevalent. So he takes blood from this malaria patient and then he looks for the, he looks at looks at this blood and you've already seen uh, in previous talks right about how there are these immune cells in blood so then then there are the red blood cells in the blood but now he found that in some of these red blood cells there is something else which is not similar to the other cells that are found in the blood the other immune cells that are found in the blood and this is where they really talk about uh, you can say that Laveran he discovered the malaria parasite in human blood however the credit that it's mosquitoes that transmit malaria. This goes to Ronald Ross. So Ronald Ross, he shows that uh, in 1897, he showed that mosquitoes are the ones that transmit a, a bird malaria. So actually, you know, lots of different organisms can get malaria, not just human, birds can get it, uh, you know, um, mice can get it, you know, monkeys can get it, like a lot, a lot of different organisms can get malaria. So here he was working with bird malaria and uh, he shows that mosquitoes can, um, uh, are the ones that carry the parasite. And how he did that was he basically took an Anopheles mosquito and he dissected it and he found that in the stomach of these mosquitoes, he could actually see parasites. So that is how he says that mosquitoes are the ones that transmit uh, malaria. And even now, if you ever go to Hyderabad, then Sikandrabad, there is this plaque, you know, which says that Sir Ronald Ross, a benefactor of mankind, 
made the great discovery of the parasites of malaria in a dissected Anopheles mosquito. And that's why he's also called Sir Ronald Ross, right? Because in the UK, if someone makes a very big contribution to science, they get something called knighthood. And that's how he is. He was knighted and he is Sir Ronald Ross. So these two people, remember, please, uh, Laveran and um, Ronald Ross. These are really the two people. And they, of course, go on to win the Nobel Prize. Uh, not yet Laveran because it had not yet started, but Ronald Ross goes on to win the uh, Nobel Prize. OK, so now the main, the big take home now is, right, what is the cause? So when you think of the cause of malaria, it's not the mosquito that is the cause, right? It is the malaria parasite that is the cause of malaria. And the vector or the vehicle is the mosquito. So what happens, right, an infected mosquito, it bites a human. These parasites enter the blood. Then these parasites uh, grow inside the human. And another mosquito now bites this infected human, picks up the parasites, moves it to another human, and so on. And the cycle continues, right? So it really is the mosquito, which is the vector or the vehicle. And you've already uh, heard about this also. Some of you who might have uh, attended the Dengu talk also, right? So where we talked, where uh, Karishma and Snehal spoke about the cause, which is in that case a virus. In this case, it's a parasite. And then the vector or the vehicle is the mosquito. And some important points, and you may know all of this already, right, is that the mosquito that transmits malaria, which is the Anopheles mosquito, is not the same one that transmits dengue, Zika, and chikungunya. So it's the Aedes mosquito that transmits dengue, Zika, and chikungunya. And the other important thing, it's always the female mosquito that is the vector. It is not the male mosquito. And the reason for this is that when the female is pregnant, she becomes very hungry. So she's really looking for a lot of food to eat, you know. And normally mosquitoes eat nectar from flowers. You know, they can eat, uh, uh, they go to ponds. They can also eat some uh, phytoplankton, other types of uh, things that are found in the pond. But then it's uh, when the female mosquito is very hungry, she finds that blood is, you know, there are lots of mammals. They have have a lot of bloods. So she can even go to a cow, for example. She can go to a goat, for example, and take blood. She can also come to a human and take up blood. And that's how malaria is transmitted. So it's really the female mosquito, which is the vector. Okay. So now just you might, some of you might recognize some of these images. So just I wanted to use this to show you that malaria parasite is neither a bacterium nor is it a virus. It is a unicellular eukaryote. What does the word eukaryote mean? Eu meaning true and carrion meaning nucleus. So you might remember this image where uh, in, a human, in humans we have trillions of cells, right? And in each cell, you see that there is this nucleus. There is also some other stuff that is found in the cell. So, and it's the nucleus in which you find the DNA, which is the genetic material, the inherited material of the, the hereditary material unit of the cell, right? So it's the nucleus. So the, when you look at a malaria parasite cell, you will see that it has a very similar structure. So it will have a nucleus inside which the DNA is found. Now, of course, in a bacterium, you don't have a nucleus. So it is a prokaryote, so pro meaning primitive. So it's primitive uh, carrion, so primitive nucleus. So that's why this is a prokaryote. So whenever we think of the malaria parasite, it is a single cell. So it is not multicellular, right? So humans are multicellular. They have many cells. However, the malaria parasite is a single cell. So it's a unicellular and it's a eukaryote, which is, it has a true nucleus. Of course, it's not similar to uh, viruses either, which are other types of uh, entities, and you've already looked at them. So um, any questions up to now? So I've been speaking a lot. Maybe we can break it up a little. Any questions? Um, Shruti, there are a few. Yeah, uh, sure. So, yeah, go, ahead, uh, go ahead, There was, I think, one question, which was, where does the malaria parasite grow in our body? Okay, so I will show you a video. In the body, there are two points. It first grows inside our liver. So that is the first point where it grows. And then it after the, but at that stage, we actually don't see any symptoms of malaria. So you can think of it as a silent phase where, you know, the parasite is growing, but it's not really causing any major disruptions to the body functions. Now, after the liver, it comes back to the blood. So it enters our body through the blood and then it leaves our body through the blood. In between, it goes to the liver. So when it comes back to the blood uh, at the second point, it grows inside red blood cells. And I have a couple of slides, you know, asking why is it that the red blood cell is so attractive, right, to the parasite? So we'll talk about that in a couple of slides. 
um then there's one question uh, which nirali has asked twice uh, yeah. regarding uh, is it true that the juice of leaves of parijatak tree is a cure for malaria is this so cure? i'm not sure about the parijata it could be i know chrysanthemum there are some other uh, plants which people have traditionally said could be a cure for malaria maybe the par- parijata tree i should look this up uh, i'm not i'm not familiar with that uh and uh, aditya asks a philosophical question uh, shruti w- yeah. over time why don't prokaryotes evolve into eukaryotes <laughs> <laughs> I, i think we should have an entire seminar on evolution right, right. so right. you know all of us came from bacteria maybe right there yes. is yes. you think of evolution we are here because first bacteria came to be right but of course the reason is that you know we might have had a common ancestor the bacteria still stayed on and there was another stream that kept developing and became humans so yes so prokaryotes are the ones that eventually resulted in eukaryotes mm. and i think that could be a very interesting session and uh, maybe karishma and snehal can think about <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you thank you uh, shruti has a long question from venkat you might want to see it sure do they affect animals do the do human and malarial parasites are they the same uh so you know for example the uh, a mosquito that is infected with uh, i will i will talk a bit about the species you know the, there are not all um, so it's uh, so, so there are many different malaria parasites not all of them infect humans some infect like i said birds so the ones that infect birds for example will not cause disease in humans okay uh, and it could also uh, so there are, of course it could also be that the type of vector is slightly different between humans and birds but for example anopheles uh, stephensi and anopheles gambiae which are which are quite well known to infect humans uh, to transmit to humans they also can bite cattle so they can go and bite a cow they can also go and bite a goat but for some reason the parasite cannot develop inside the goat or the cow so um, it's a very interesting question right so maybe by studying differences between cows and humans also we can understand why is it that infects humans and not cow right so maybe because of course men a big difference is that the blood will be different right the blood mm-hmm. the blood cells of human will be different from the blood cells of cows and goats so maybe for that reason they might not be able to uh, infect uh, the those animals but cause an infection in humans mm-hmm. uh, and uh, maybe one or two more questions shruti sure. one thing uh, is malaria causing kidney failure yes severe malaria can cause kidney yes. failure that's true like but- that's that's usually because of other damages that happen along the way so it's not that it goes and infects the kidney hmm. but it's more a symptom because the blood there's so much blood loss and uh, uh, those m- m- mostly due to that yeah okay so there uh, is artist yeah so he talks about receptors linked to our body so I mean that you bring this idea of receptor so think of any cell right so a cell has lots of proteins on its you know that it's sticking out which we can call receptors so it might be the reason why it could infect humans and not cows is because the cows don't have the receptors for the parasite to first bind to attach to and then get into the cell so in i think in the ne- next couple of slides i have a nice some nice videos which might also explain you know how is it causing infection and last question shruti last question yeah. kanishka has asked this many times which veda describes mosquitoes causing fever which veda oh which of the four vedas oh. <laughs> now i realized there are four <laughs> yeah there are four so there is rig yajur atharva veda and kama veda kama and atharva uh-huh. yeah four i know that there are four sorry i had that's an excellent question i am going to go and find out and <laughs> i'll try to tell you tanishka thank you tanishka thank you look at that ha huh, shruti never a dull moment yeah. <laughs> but the thing is they just refer to it as vedic text right exactly. i've never gone on to find out but i mean we could probably do a process of elimination because each text has a certain theme so maybe there's one text that yeah. talks about medical stuff so yeah. maybe, maybe. Yeah. Okay Raga we'll come to that in a bit okay let's move on a little bit yeah. sure yeah. sure thanks okay let's move on so uh, these are just some of you asked about how do we know it is really the you know malaria it's malaria in the blood so i think this middle image is basically what does it so you can take the blood and you have slides so some of you have been doing experiments right so you can actually 
take the blood you kind of smear it onto a glass surface and then to that glass surface you can add very specific dyes you know these dyes that bind to specific things in the blood so usually the dna in the blood and one very important thing right is actually red blood cells do not have a nucleus so somehow along the way they have lost the nucleus so you can see some images here where there is no uh, blue staining and that would be a blood red blood cell that does not have a parasite whereas there are these which have the parasite right so those are the ones that will take up the dye are the ones that have parasites and they actually have very distinct you know the parasite actually when it's growing inside the blood it grows over a period of 48 hours and as it's growing you'll see that the shape of the parasite also changes so for example here it's shown 6 hours 10 hours 16 hours 20 hours so over time the shape is changing so you can also say when you do this kind of a smear of the blood, you can also say which stage of the parasite, sorry, which stage of the parasite is found in the blood. Then there are others. So this is a very simple uh, way of looking at this. So you can uh, basically use a very simple light microscope. And uh, some of you might have heard of this fold scope, for example, you know, which is now all the rage. So even that kind of a fold scope, you can actually uh, look at these types of smears and the staining. On the left and the right, these images are a little more complicated. You've heard a bit about the green fluorescent protein, you know, these proteins that have that, that are able to shine or, you know, they're able to emit some color, uh, radiations, which we can detect. So to the right here would be something where a parasite is expressing a green fluorescence protein. And then the nucleus would be N here is the nucleus that the DNA is stained in red. So that is the red color here. And then on the left, you can actually take the blood cell and just look at the surface of the blood cell. You know, you don't even have to like look at layers. You just look at the overall shape of the blood cell and you can see here, you know, as compared to an uninfected red blood cell, the infected red blood cell has quite a different shape. So these are different ways in which people can look at the parasite in the blood. Uh, so uh, the ones which, so these are just some images I thought which could be interesting. The point I also wanted to make is, you know, this shape I'm showing here is very specific for one particular species of parasite. So if you think of all organisms, right, we have a scientific name, the which would be say homo sapiens homo is the genus sapiens is the species so similarly for the malaria parasite the genus is plasmodium and then the species there are five different species that can cause malaria in humans so you have falciparum you have vivax you have malaria you have ovale and null size. So these are five different species that can cause malaria in humans. And what is interesting is I'm showing the stained image here. This is for one particular species called Plasmodium falciparum. But Plasmodium vivax will have a slightly different shape when it is inside the red blood cell. Malaria, again, will have a slightly different shape. So again, by just doing a blood smear, doctors, especially very highly trained doctors, can say, okay, this person has... Plasmodium falciparum infection. This other person has plasmodium vivax infection, etc. So that's why uh, the blood smear is still a very important technique for detecting the malaria parasite. And we, when we are growing the parasite in blood in the lab, we are constantly doing these types of blood smears to really know what stage our parasites are growing in. So we do this all the time. So now uh, just a bit about, you know, what are the ones that we find in India, right? So plasmodium, like I said, there are five species, but of these five species, the two most important species that we find in India are plasmodium falciparum and plasmodium vivax. And if you look at the map here, the left image is for plasmodium falciparum and the right image is for plasmodium vivax. And these two kind of states here, you know, Chat CH is Chhattisgarh. OR is uh, Orissa. So Ch Chhattisgarh, Orissa, and JH is Jharkhand. So these three states really uh, account, for, account for a lot of the malaria cases in India. Also the northeastern states. So um, Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura, uh, Mizoram, to, to a lesser extent. But even these uh, states have malaria. 
and uh, people are really trying to understand you know how is the malaria in these regions you know in one part of india is it the same as malaria in another part of india these are some kinds of questions we can ask you know and then uh, plasmodium vivax is more prevalent across india i mean i think it's uh, there in many parts of india and the another very interesting thing about plasmodium vivax is that say i get a mosquito bite today i get plasmodium vivax i can take some medicine i'm cured of it however suddenly 5 years later i start presenting with malaria like symptoms you know and uh, people all like how does this happen because this uh, plasmodium vivax is very clever it's i think the cleverest parasite you know cleverer than plasmodium falciparum it has found a way to hide in our liver and it can hide in our liver for 5 years 10 years sometimes even 15 years and suddenly even without a mosquito bite for example some say someone comes to uh, india from the us they get bitten by plasmodium vivax they go back to the us and suddenly 15 years later they get malaria you know so it's because they could have been carrying the plasmodium vivax parasite they could have been bitten by it by the mosquito that carried this parasite and it goes and hides in their liver and suddenly many years later they get the symptoms of malaria without any uh, you know another mosquito bite so these are some things which are quite interesting about plasmodium vivax so really it, they can hide in the body and they hide in the liver so that's very interesting about plasmodium vivax okay oh, so i think shruti yeah. uh, one of them has commented yeah. the hiding in the liver is like it goes offline like a cpu less computer <laughs> it's very interesting and we always wonder what is that plug right like yeah. what is that cpu that kind of causes it to come you know come alive i mean exactly. awake again think of it as sleeping or hiding what is it that asks makes it come out of hiding you know that's a very important scientific question that we still don't have an answer for you know like how does it come out and again cause an infection that is super interesting it's one of the i think really interesting questions that still exists in malaria research So, so yeah i love this i will use this cpu idea for yes, sure yes, future, you share it with in a future you. talk thank you so <laughs> there are a few more questions tanishka yeah. had a good question originally in ancient india how did the did malaria come from traders uh so so there are two theories so i was in i was actually initially thinking about how do you you know talking about how malaria moved from different parts uh, of uh, the world so there's one theory that malaria originated in uh, ethiopia so which is very similar to how you know the out of africa theory for most mm-hmm. for humans there is this th- theory that humans originated in africa and then moved away so in uh, there's one theory that um, plasmodium falciparum it jumped from uh, apes you know chimpanzees used to have plasmodium falciparum and somehow because humans used to live very close to forests at some point plasmodium falciparum also jumped to humans this might have happened in africa and you're right uh, most likely because there was a lot of trade between africa and india people were moving that's how it was brought to india that is one theory the other uh, theory is that uh, malaria especially plasmodium vivax they think originated in uh, southeast asia so thailand cambodia that area people think plasmodium vivax came there and then plasmodium vivax moved to india again because at that time we used to have a lot of trade uh, with those countries so uh, i i think what tanishka said is probably true because they probably carried um, the parasite and maybe also mosquito larvae right so not just not the mosquitoes themselves but they might have carried some mosquito larvae as well and that's how the mosquitoes were also introduced into um, into india so that could be the region, reason and what is very interesting actually is plasmodium vivax has been with humans for much longer as compared to plasmodium falciparum so if you look at the timeline at what point did uh, plasmodium falciparum jump from chimpanzees to humans that is much more re- recent maybe you know 3 million years ago or whereas vivax is thought to be with us for much longer so that's another interesting uh, point okay shall we move on uh, yeah. so there's just one question from venkat ashuti does malaria have a dependency yeah. with temperature and climate so the malaria itself the parasite itself doesn't but the vector does so the mosquito is grows best at a temperature of around 25 degrees so if the temperature starts increasing too much beyond that the mosquito does not survive 
However, this is not the case anymore. With climate change, what people are observing is that the mosquito has also adapted. So the mosquito is also learning to survive at higher temperatures. And at one point, it was also thought that the mosquito only comes to low-lying regions. It does not go to hilly areas, for example. But now definitely in Africa, people are seeing that the Anopheles mosquito, you can also find it in hilly regions. So I think as humans are adapting to different uh, environments, you know, I think the mosquito is also constantly adapting to different uh, environments. Uh, and Shruti, there's one question, good question. How, do, mm -hmm. how does animal malaria present? Is it fever? Is it chills? Is it like humans? <laughs> like, so like I said, I mean, usually you don't really see um, um, animal malaria from the same species, like I said, but I would, uh, the symptoms would be very similar because even, even in say, uh, in the case of uh, mice, people sometimes use these to study certain yeah. aspects in the lab. So in the case of mice, for sure, and in the case of birds, um, more than fevers and chills, you will see anemia. So anemia tends to be quite, uh, but fevers will happen because usually the fever, the reason the fever is happening is because so the parasite, like I told you, has around 48 hours, it grows inside the red blood cell. And then it has to come out of the red blood cell. So how does it come out of the red blood cell? It usually kind of uh, causes a burst so that the entire, you can think of the red blood cell as exploding and the parasites are coming out. And then once they come, every time that happens, that means red blood cells are dying, right? So that also usually causes a spike in temperature. And that's when the fever is observed. So you would see fevers in um, other animals also. But uh, the yeah, so but anemia tends to be a very uh, more common symptom in animals that people look at. Okay. Okay. We can move on if you want. We can right. come back to a few questions later. Sure. 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 Okay. So next, I actually have uh, two videos. I'll show a video first of how the parasite develops in humans. And uh, then I'll show you a video of how it develops in mosquitoes. And I think this is very interesting. This was made by this video was made by scientists who are malaria researchers. They are in Australia. There's this uh, institute called the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. And there are some excellent uh, malaria researchers there. So they made this video and they actually study many of the processes that you will see that are uh, going to be shown here. One thing that you have to remember, which I would like, I mean, which I would like you to remember is that the parasite is growing inside another cell, right? So it can't grow freely. Like bacteria, for example, can grow freely. There are some bacteria which also grow inside other cells, but most bacteria can grow freely, whereas plasmodium parasite needs another home. So it needs another cell to be its home. And in this case, it has chosen the red blood cell. It will also choose the liver cell first, then it chooses the red blood cell. This is what you will see in the video. So I'm just going to play the video. So tell me if the you malaria can hear it. parasite is an ancient organism. It has been since before we were human. Famous victims include Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, and George Washington. life cycle follows a devious path, swapping back and forth between mosquitoes and humans. This mosquito is infected with malaria parasite. Because she is pregnant, she has become hungry for human blood. During the bite, she injects saliva to stop the blood from clotting. Her infected saliva also is a malaria parasite. The parasite rides the bloodstream like a network of roads, seeking its first target, the core of your body's blood filter system, the liver. Sensing its arrival at the liver, the parasite searches for an exit. A 
sentinel Kupfer cell is the entry point to liver tissue. Leaving the blood, the parasite infects a liver cell, killing one or more other cells on its way. Over the next few days, the parasite undergoes hundreds of nuclear divisions, copying its DNA over and over again. A single infected liver cell can create thousands of new parasites. The next generation of parasites are modified to infect a new target. Red blood cells. Inside a red blood cell, the parasite can hide from the body's immune system. The parasite slowly devours the contents of the infected cell and creates more parasites. The infected cell becomes sticky and grips onto blood vessel walls. Once mature, the infected cell bursts, spreading more parasites through the bloodstream. Malaria victims suffer fever, loss of blood, convulsions, brain damage, and coma. Countless millions have been killed by it. Most people who die from the disease are pregnant women and children under the age of five. So yeah, so like I think this video, I think, is really a great way of, you know, seeing how the parasite is coming into our body and then uh, finding its target cell, which is finally the red blood cell, right? And like uh, they showed here, just a quick recap. So you have these sporozoites. They are the ones that are injected into the blood. These go to the liver. They can, from one sporozoite, you can get up to 10,000 parasites, right? So it keeps copying its DNA over and over and forming dot one from one mother cell. You get daughter cells. So it can form up to 10,000 copies of itself. And these 10,000 copies are then released into the blood. And these are the ones that... Uh, can infect the red blood cell and then also the cycle can continue. So this is what's happening in humans. Do we have time to look at the mosquito stage or what do you think? Because it's um, already... Uh, close to six. No problem, Shruti. We can take a few more questions. Okay. Is that okay? Sure. Uh, Shruti, yeah. Ansh had a great question. Yeah. Why doesn't the mosquito die when it has the parasite in the body? So the mosquito actually, uh, even though it's infected with malaria, the way the parasite is living in the mosquito, it does not really affect any of its functions right here because of the types of uh, type of environment it is found to live in the mosquito in plasma in the case of humans since it's inside the blood and blood is so important for us to live right so and uh, these red blood cells because you start losing them that means you lose the hemoglobin and you can't you lose the ox ability to carry oxygen to different parts of the body so that's why you see these symptoms um, and the blood supply also is important for many other things okay. but in the case of mosquitoes and we'll see that and it's shown in this cycle here it actually goes to the stomach so the gut right so it goes to the stomach of the mosquito and then it also doesn't really seem to uh, uh, the stage in which it is growing which is actually this stage the oocyst stage and you will see in the video next this stage is a free it's an extracellular stage that means it's not inside a mosquito cell that means while it is growing that means from one parasite when you're making multiple copies of the parasite it is not doing this inside another cell so in humans as we just saw it's either inside a liver cell or it's inside a red blood cell right and then it has to kill these cells to come out However, because here the growth is not happening inside a mosquito cell, it doesn't really seem to cause any symptoms in the mosquito. It doesn't kill the mosquito. 
and these you know these sporozoites are very interesting they come kind of they move and they're stored in the salivary gland of the mosquito and they can stay there for days you know 10 days 20 days without doing anything they just keep resting there until now the mosquito finds a new human to kind of infect oh, all right shruti we can move on sure oh, yeah right. okay so next we'll watch what is happening inside the mosquito and uh, i mean i have a lot more slides but i think we'll have to wrap it up after sure, that sure. i'll right. say a couple of other points and then we can wrap up unless people are interested i can keep talking <laughs> okay no so worries. let's now so like i said in human blood in humans it is an always an intracellular so inside the cell parasite for developing whereas in uh, mosquitoes it is both extracellular and intracellular which you will see in this video Mosquitoes are usually vegetarian, preferring to drink nectar, fruit juices, and honeydew. Only a pregnant mosquito will bite humans, seeking nutrients from blood to nourish her developing eggs. If she drinks blood from someone infected with malaria, she too becomes infected with the disease. The tiny drop of blood filling the insect's stomach is teeming with malaria parasites. The parasite form that is deadly inside humans cannot survive in the mosquito's stomach and is slowly digested with the rest of her blood meal. However, back in the human host, a few of the parasites turned into a different type of cell. one that is sexual but remains dormant malaria sex is triggered when the warm human blood begins to cool inside the insect's stomach the female form of the parasite matures into an egg the male form takes a while longer to mature into sperm This sperm is from an earlier feed. The fertilized cell can glide and begins to explore its new environment. migrates to the outer lining of the mosquito's stomach before transforming into a cyst. Each cyst produces thousands of thin, tiny parasites which seek out and infest the mosquito's salivary glands. The next time this mosquito bites a victim, the malaria parasite will ride in with their saliva and infect another human. Okay. So uh, I think here are these forms, right? So just a quick recap. So in the human blood itself, there are some parasites that become into what are called the sexual forms because these are the ones that are then able to actually cause an infection in the mosquito. 
So these sexual forms, just think of them as sexual forms. You don't need to remember their names. These are the ones that eventually will uh, kind of, uh, you have a male sexual form, you have a female sexual form, they come together, and then you have the formation of the zygote, which can then eventually uh, form new parasites. And these parasites are eventually, they make it and stay inside the salivary gland. So these are the extracellular stages, as I was saying. So these, this really is like the, you know, very interesting to me, you know, about how the parasite, it really can, even though it's a unicellular organism, right? We were talking about a single, a single cell organism. It can, it can really come into all these different shapes and forms, right? So it's very interesting to me, like, how does it decide, okay, at this point, it should become this shape. At, the, what, at what other point should it form another shape? You know, these types of things are very interesting to study. So what is the trigger for these types of things? So what is the signal? You know, is there some signal that says you become this or you become this? So these are kinds of things we'd like to study. So I think I will leave you with a couple more slides um, just to yeah, say what is... just wrap up. Yeah. And I'll wrap up. So what we'd really like to study is these human blood stages. And this is because all of the symptoms of malaria, fever, shivers, uh, anemia, all of this is happening during this stage. So if we want to cure malaria, we really want to cure this stage. So this is, and we also like to, you know, we get human blood from a blood bank and we kind of grow the parasite. And this is what we like to study. And one question maybe before we leave, this could be the last question is, why do you think in humans, the parasite has chosen the red blood cell as its home? Any thoughts? Uh, maybe we can answer. Uh, sure. Okay, uh, answer Shruti's question. Uh, Aditya says it comes in close contact with WBCs. Space. What else? Get space is important. Yes. Oxygen. It can get oxygen. Sure. It doesn't draw attention. That's very interesting. It's actually hiding inside a red blood cell. So the immune system can't think of it as its own cell, right? So it's not going to do much to it. True. It can obtain most of the nutrients from RBC. Very good. And wider reach through the blood. Also very true. And it's one of the most common cells. Yes, Aditya, that's great. So, um, and more accessible to the liver. So though the, once the parasite is in the blood, it won't go back to the liver, but yes, from the liver to get into the blood for sure. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are important. So let me end by saying the reason, all of you point to these reasons. And it is because in the blood, 99% of the cells are blood cells, are the red blood cells, right? So it's the highly abundant cell that is found. So some, someone already mentioned that. They also, like I said, do not have a nucleus and other stuff. So there's a lot of room for the parasite to grow in. And then of course, mosquitoes drink the blood so that then it, if it has to found, find another victim, another new host, it has to be inside the blood. And this is just to show, you know, like how the parasite, once it gets into the red blood cell, it really changes the red blood cell completely. Like you can look at this image, you can see this again, I was telling you is this image where you kind of just look at the surface of the red blood cell. If you think of it as a bag of liquid, right? So you're just looking at the surface. So you see how the surface has really been modified. And this is more of a cartoon representation where you have this uninfected uh, Erythrocyte is another name for the red blood cell. So you have this uh, red blood cell, which is not infected. And once it is infected, you can see there's so many changes that are happening. And all of these are caused by the parasite. So um, these are some, you know, this is, I think I will end here. I mean, I have a couple more slides about what we do in the lab, but I think uh, you can always go back and take a look at the slides and you can email me if you have any questions about that. So I will move to the last, yeah. So the take home that I really want you to, you know, take what, what, I, what would I like you to take away from this uh, talk is that it is caused, malaria is caused by plasmodium parasites. These are eukaryotes. These are not bacteria. They're not viruses, right? So these are eukaryotes, uh, the plasmodium parasites. India is very important in the case of, uh, you know, in the global scenario of malaria because the fourth, uh, the, it is the fourth uh, largest numbers of cases are found in India. 
and uh, i did not talk about this but just to remember that there are medicines so if you get malaria you can be cured so there are medicines that are available but the parasite is fighting them and uh, there is no effective vaccine if uh, if we had a effective vaccine that would really push us towards eliminating malaria so we are much closer so even if i compare to 20 years ago you know we are much closer to you know getting rid of malaria from the world but we are not there yet and that's why people like me have a job right we keep continue because we study the parasite we are trying to find new medicines we are trying to find vaccines so these are types of uh, things that we do and another thing is i also like love art so i just wanted to show this uh, i think a i find the malaria parasite beautiful right so i wanted to use art to show it so this is the blood stage malaria parasite which i've just shown as more of a you know artistic representation so if any of you is interested in art science and art can go together there is absolutely no need that you only have to follow science you have to only follow art right you can do both and you can be very happy doing both with that yeah my thank you slide i really would like to thank uh, karishma and snehal i've enjoyed myself a lot and of course we'll take a few more questions if there are and i have a fantastic team of researchers so this is what keeps me going mm -hmm.